Good morning, church. Good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. We have some that were not feeling well last week, able to be with us this week. We have some that felt good last week and were with us that are not here this week. We have others traveling, and so we're thankful that you're here as we've come together to study a portion of God's holy and divine word. Joe is his name. Joe had not been feeling well. And so Joe had gone to his doctor to see exactly what ailed him. It had been going on for quite a period of time. and The doctor had looked at some things before and never really found anything that, uh, at least in office visits, that would conclude anything that would be a diagnosis. And so he thought and he realized that, you know, maybe Joe just needed to go to the hospital for a couple of days to get some tests run there that they could run and, and do some things and see some things and monitor some things that uh, the doctor wanted to see. And so Joe went through the emergency room. They put him in the hospital. And when they ran the test, the doctor came in a couple of days and he said, well, he said, I think I can explain it, but I don't know what we can do about it. Well, that's not some comforting things you want to hear from a doctor, but nevertheless, he said, well, doctor, tell me what's going on. And he says, well, you have probably something you've had all of your life, and it's probably a genetic disorder. But the problem is, is that your heart is really kind of flipped on you, and it's kind of on the wrong side of your body. It's, it's not the right angle that it should be, and it's creating, I think, all of your problems that you're having. And he said, but there's really nothing we can do about it. You've had it all of your life, and we'll just have to learn to kind of manage everything as we go. Well, that's an unusual case, admittedly. But yet it is something that reminds us of how important the biblical heart is. In Proverbs chapter 4, and verse 23, kind of our impetus for this morning, Solomon says to keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep your heart. That's a great challenge. We've been spending some time, and we're going to spend some further time uh, for the next several weeks, looking at self-improvement. And when you talk about self-improvement, one of the things that we all have to improve is our heart. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we, how, how do we go about keeping our heart? How do we go about disciplining our heart? How do we keep our heart to be the heart that God would have it to be? Understanding from a biblical standpoint that the heart is the center of all emotions and all will, that it is where we intend and our purpose comes from. It is, if you will, considered what we might consider the brainchild of the Christian life. It is the center and the focus from which everything comes from. Matter of fact, in, in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus reminds us, out of the heart come. And then he lists things such as evil thoughts and words and deeds and actions. And he says, these all come from the heart. And so it's important that we keep our heart with all diligence. But how do we accomplish that challenge? How do we accomplish that task? How do we go about it? Well, I, let me submit to you, first of all, that you keep your heart full. You know, if you fill something up, and if you fill it up to its complete capacity, there's nothing else you can put in it. There's nothing else that will go. Stories told, it's really of a time management illustration, and I may have shared it with you before, but it's a great story that proves the point that I want us to make. And that is that there was a man one time that he was a professional speaker, and so he was hired by a company to go in and to give a talk to the managers. And so he did. It was a large auditorium. It was full. Managers from all over had come to, to this conference. And so he, he talks about filling your life. And so he brings out a huge box. And he has balls, very large balls, the size of beach balls put into to this box. And it filled the box full, matter of fact, to the top. And he asked his audience, he said, is this box full? 
And there were those sitting there that said, why, yes, it's full. And so then he got out a couple of buckets of baseballs and he poured them into the box and they went around where the beach balls were. And he said, you see, it wasn't full. And so he said, now is it full? And they all said, well, yes, it's full. And so then he pulled out buckets of BBs and he poured several buckets of BBs into that box. And he said, you see, it wasn't full. But now is it full? And, you know, they're all kind of scratching their heads, but quite a few of them said, yeah, it's full. And he pulled out several buckets of sand. And he took the sand and poured it in, and it filled all of the places in, all the little areas in. He said, is it full? And, of course, they were catching on by that time, and they just all looked at each other. And he pulled out several buckets of water, and he poured water then into the box. He said, as it filled to the very top, he said, now it's full. And his point was this. He says, we fill our life with big issues. And then there are some that are not quite as big, but they're still very important. And we fill our life with those. And then we fill our life with more and more and more and more. And that's when we're full. It's not just the big issues. We have to understand that our life, our heart, needs to be kept full. That we need to be individuals that fill our life with the Word of God. That our heart is full of God's Word. That doesn't mean that if I were to quote a verse, you could tell me ex exactly where it came from. That doesn't mean that, that you should be able to quote everything that's in there. If you're like me, you've probably forgot more than you remember. But it is to say that our hearts should be full of what God has told us and what God has given to us. You see, David said in Psalm 119, verse 11, you're probably ahead of me. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The purpose of hiding the word of God in his heart was so that he might not sin against you. Paul said it this way in Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Colossians 3, verse 16. To be filled with God's word, filled with his revelation, to be filled with what he's told you. That's important. In Psalm 1, the psalm, psalmist reminds us, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the ways of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But verse 2, he says, but his delight's in the law. And in that law does he meditate day and night. He spends time with God, but then he also spends time thinking about God's will. He fills his heart with God. As Christians, if we want to keep our heart, we fill it with God. We fill it with his revelation. And that doesn't mean that, oh, we've got to sit around and every time, you know, that we can, we open up our Bible and we sit there and we read our Bible. No. There's times for good shows. There's times for good movies. There's time for good books. There's time for family and family conversation. There's time for work. There's time to just pull back and rest and relax. There's time to, to do all things of life. But you see, we've got to keep that heart full of something or we'll be like Jesus talked about in Matthew 12. Remember, there was a man that, that demons went out from him. A demon went out from him. He went out and he went searching and he went through, the, according to the scriptures there, he went through the deserted places, he went through the dry places and he could not find rest and he came back and when he came back, he basically found that the man had swept his house clean but had not filled his heart with anything. And so what did the demon do? He brought some of his friends. And they resided in the man's heart. And it was worse off than he was in the beginning. And the point of the, of the story there that Jesus was trying to tell is, don't clean out your heart and then not put anything in it. Bare spots 
without attention, bring weeds. You might say, what in the world, Brother Paul, does that have to do with anything? Well, I want you to hear this. But, no, that's not it. But, but, <laughs> he is so cute. Back years ago, when I moved, when Suzanne and I and Ethan, we moved to Dixon years ago, we bought the house. We unfortunately knew the individual we bought the house from. Basketball coach, not basketball, he retired. Basketball coach at McEwen. Great guy. We'd known him for a long time because they had a son that played ball with our son. So it was, it was a, a great fit. But anyway, we bought our house. And when he moved, his boys were so big, he said, I've left you a swing set. Oh, gee, thanks. They have whatever parent wants is a swing set for their child. And my son, our son, Ethan, was a little bit getting on the little bit larger side of, for that swing set. But nevertheless, there was a slide attached to that swing set. And every week I mowed around that slide. We needed around it begrudged the fact that Phil didn't take it with him. And so I left it for several years. Eventually, the slide, I, I took it and I, I put it, turned it over because I couldn't figure out what to do with it. I couldn't figure out, to be honest, how to get rid of it. And so, as it stayed there, some about 10 years, all told, between Phil and, and us, I decided one day I know I now have the answer and I know how and what I'm going to do with it. And so I took that slide and I picked it up and I put it where I wanted to put it. I eventually did get rid of it, by the way. But when I removed it, I knew what was there and I knew what I was getting into. There was a bare spot where it had sat for so many years and it shaded out the grass until nothing would grow there. And when I removed the slide and put it somewhere else, I watched that bare spot. And while I was an individual, yes, I planted grass seed all over this yard and different places. I didn't tend to that spot. And I watched, and it wasn't but just a matter of time until there were weeds there. Not good grass. A grass, yes, but weeds. And every time I think of that, I can't help but think about how the fact that so many times in our lives, we have bare spots, bare spots in our heart, and we don't fill it with anything. And yet the heart, which can be easily trained, needs to be open. You know, if you go back and read in, in Acts 16, the story of Lydia, you remember that Paul came to him, came to her, and you remember what it says there about her? It says, for her heart was open. She was ready to listen and to take it in. She wanted to hear what was being said and she wanted to bring it into her life. Dear friends, in our lives, if we're going to keep our hearts with all diligence, we have to keep it full and we have to fill it completely. We fill it with God's word. And so, if we want to keep our hearts pure, we keep it full. But we not only keep it full, but we keep it pure. You might say, well, preacher, that kind of makes sense. Well, does it really? Purity is really one of the trademarks of Christianity. Keep yourself pure. Paul told Timothy, keep yourself pure. Purity is a trademark. We are pure. We are made pure by the blood of Christ. Sin stains us, doesn't it? Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Now, when we get to the imagery there in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it helps us, or it helps me, and hopefully it'll help you, to understand that Isaiah's imagery of a scarlet is of something that is dipped in dye, not once, but twice. Back several years ago, Suzanne tie-dyed T-shirts for her children in kindergarten. This was when she was still, not her, but she was teaching kindergarten. <laughs> she stayed many years in kindergarten, by the way. But she tie-dyed. And if you tie-dye, you put those shirts in the dye and, and it comes out that color. But if you really want that color and you want it deep and dark and you want it to stay, you dip it twice. And Isaiah says, your sins have dipped you such that you are scarlet. You are so stained by sin. But he says, 
God's going to make you white. God's going to make you pure. God's going to, going to make sure that, that you're, you are his. And so, while we are buried with him by baptism, according to Romans 6, we rise up to walk in newness of life, new creation, new creatures, forgiven of the past sins, but washed clean according to Hebrews chapter 9. It's not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood. He entered once into the holy temple made for us for the purpose of what? Cleansing us of all our sins. As Christians, when we become Christians, we're made pure. The stain of sin is gone. The forgiveness of God makes us as white as snow. But that purity must be maintained. It's maintained by the blood of Christ, which seems to be so foreign to our understanding. And so we ultimately ask the question how, and the answer is we don't need to understand the how. We just need to understand that it does. There's a lot of things in life I don't understand the how, but I understand that it does. And John says that if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. How does blood cleanse? Blood stains, not the blood of Christ. It cleanses, and it continues to cleanse us. As we continue to walk with him, it continues to cleanse us from our mistakes, from our past, from the things that we've done, from the things in our life that that are not according to, to what they should be. And so, and so we we are reminded in Matthew chapter five and verse six that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, dear friends, I don't know about you, but I want to see God, don't you? I think you do, or you wouldn't be here this morning. Well, how do we go about seeing God? Well, we've got to keep our hearts pure. That's how. That's how we see God. So then comes the question. Hmm, I've got to keep my heart pure. How do, how do I go about doing that? How do I go about keeping my heart pure? If purity is the trademark of Christians, and if the pure in heart see God, and I want to see God, then, then how do I go about keeping my heart pure? This is, after all, this is a series on, on self-improvement. Well, Paul gives us one answer. Philippians chapter 4. We read there in verse 8. That finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So here comes the question. What are you thinking about? What do you think about as the days go by? What do you think about? What's your focus in your in your thoughts? What do you spend time thinking about? Well, preacher, I spend time thinking about my work. I spend time thinking about my family, my children, my grandchildren. I spend time thinking about the church. I spend time thinking about the Bible that I've meditated upon. I spend time. Great. You're keeping that heart full of God and his will, but you're keeping your heart pure by thinking on the things, as Paul says, that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely. But then it's interesting because if you're in Proverbs 4, if you look at the text in verse 23, it's interesting because in verse 24, he gives us some further insight. He says, put away from you. Now, notice what he says, a deceitful mouth. He says, you want to keep your heart pure? Watch what you say. Watch what you say. Be careful. Guard your words. Think about them twice. You know, the old adage that a uses of measure twice and cut once is well a well put adverb or, or, or phrase for us as well to think about what we say before we say it to let it kind of run through the head and go through some of the filters but then he goes on and he says verse 25 he says let your eyes look straight ahead he says be careful where your eyes are Be careful what you're looking at. Be careful what you're seeing. There's a lot in this world to see that's not worthy of seeing. I was going through headlines this week, and and there's a 
a, a new fad, and that's really not a new fad, but it's a fad that's catching on. And let me just say, without getting into it and the details therein, it's basically a fad of more nudity and less clothes. Solomon says, let your eyes be straightforward. Be careful what you look at. But then notice what he says in verse 26, ponder the path of your feet. In other words, watch where you're going. Where do you show up? Where do you show up through the week? Where do you show up at night when you're not at work? Where do you show up for your leisure time? Where do you show up? How do you keep your heart pure? You be careful where you show up. Be careful that you show up in the right places. You keep your heart pure. In order to keep your heart pure, that's how you're keeping your heart. But you keep it pure by thinking about your words. Be careful what you take in. Be careful where you go. Why? Because the old computer saying that used to be used long time ago, and I'm sure probably in computer circles, it's probably still used probably in a different way, but garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. Whatever you put in your heart is what you're going to get out of your life. The story is told of a man that he would watch the janitor in the evenings and He was always amazed. The janitor would be mopping the floor as he'd be going home, but the mop was always clean. How in the world can the janitor always have a clean mop when he's mopping the floor? And so finally, one night, one evening on his way out, he stopped and he usually said a few things to the janitor. And as they were talking, he said, can I ask you something? And the janitor said, well, sure. He said, how do you keep that mop clean all the time? Janitor smiled at him. He said, why, it's easy. Well, what's the secret? I want to know. He said, you keep the floor clean and the mop will stay clean. You keep the heart pure and the life will stay pure. So, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And what will happen? That's James 4, verse 7. What will happen? Matthew 5, verse 6. You'll see God. And so Solomon says, keep your heart with all diligence. Keep it full. Keep it pure. But then he says, keep it undivided. Hmm. Undivided. How do we do that? What is it entailed? In Psalm 86... Verse 11, the psalmist asked God to keep his heart united. That's an interesting question. But it's the idea of we become compartmentalized and we become compartmentalized in our life to the point that we become divided even in thought. And so what are we doing? We're running around, as the old saying goes, like a chicken without a head. We're running around seemingly to accomplish everything, but only to accomplish nothing. And our priorities get messed up. Things get out of whack. Things get out of line. Do you know what you're going to do this week? The appointments that you've got? The things that you've got to accomplish, the things that you've got to do this week? You already made that list, whether physically or mentally. You've made that list of what you're going to do. Those are your priorities. Those are the things that are going to get done. I can tell you what's going to happen this week. I can actually tell you, unless something terrible changes, I can tell you what I'm going to preach on next Sunday. I've already been thinking a little bit about it. Our life sometimes becomes divided because we lose our focus and our purpose. We're sometimes like the gentleman that was set on one Saturday he was going to plow the back 40. And so he set out to plow the back 40. As it, on the way out to the tractor, he remembered that the tractor needed some oil, and so he went to the barn to get the oil. On the way to the barn, he looked there, and he noticed the seed potatoes needed 
tending to. And so he tended to them. And when he looked up from them, he noticed that some of his tomatoes and garden grass had grown pretty tall and it needed to be cut out. And so he went and he cut it out. Only then to come to the end and kind of kneel to catch his breath when one of the chickens walked up and he noticed that he was hurt. And so he went to tend to him and then found several others chickens that needed tending to. And so he tended to them. He gathered the eggs. He carried them into the house. And on and on the day went until the end of the day, as the sun began to set, he realized he had never plowed the back 40 like he was intending on doing. Why? Because so many things had popped up that had taken over the, if you will, the plan that seemed so immediate and seemed so important, but in reality weren't as much as plowing the back 40, but they had overtaken what he had intended on doing. The story in Luke chapter 10 is the same way. Jesus comes into the house of Mary. Jesus rebukes sister. Why? Because she wants Jesus to rebuke her sister because she's not helping him serve. You see, everybody's here. Everybody's here at my house and I'm busy serving. Jesus rebukes her. He says, Martha, you're, you're cumbered about. You're distracted with much serving. And he says, one thing is needful. She, talking about Mary, has chosen the good part. You see, she had sat at the feet of Jesus. She had made her purpose, not so much filling the tea glasses and making sure everybody's place was full and everybody was having a good time. She would made sure that she'd listened to the words of the Lord. She had a purpose. Our purpose, we become somewhat distracted. Solomon in Proverbs, if you're there in chapter four, you might have to turn your page like I do in my Bible, but in the fifth chapter, you remember what he says? My son, pay attention to my wisdom and lend your ears to my understanding. Here's what he says. Listen up. Pay attention. Don't lose sight of your goal. Don't lose sight of the end and make sure that your direction is what it should be and that it should be towards God. For blessed are they who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Psalm 119 and verse 2. And so the heart has one purpose, one end, one goal to get to heaven. That's the desire of the heart. We keep our heart with all diligence because out of it spring everything that we do. And so I want to keep my heart with all diligence. So what do I do? Well, I keep it, first of all, full as best I can. I keep it as pure as I possibly can. And I keep it as undivided, singularly, singular in focus, and intent as I possibly can. That's how we keep our heart pure. That's how we keep our heart with all diligence. Mary was an Olympian. She was an Olympian marksman, shot clay pigeons. She'd won three years for three or three Olympic straight. She'd won gold medal. Someone asked her as she was going for her fourth, someone asked her, they said, how in the world do you do it? And she says, I shoot 5,000 clay pigeons a week. I take time off for Christmas Day and 4th of July, and that's it. Every other day, I'm shooting. That's how I do it. Sunday is for the Lord. Monday is for the Lord. Tuesday is for the Lord. Wednesday is for the Lord. Thursday is for the Lord. Friday is for the Lord. Saturday is for the Lord. How do I do that? By keeping my heart, letting my light shine, being what God would have me to be. And I, it all starts by keeping the floor clean. This morning, if you're not a New Testament child of God, or an individual that needs to rededicate your life, our prayer is that you'll come.
I'll have to give it a stand and see.